podcasting, uh, delegating, or orchestrating. Uh, we are going to uh, spend the next two hours talking about live peer and um, all things around it. So if you're new uh, to this, please um, feel free to put up your hand and, and come up to stage where you can introduce yourself and um, and we can talk about things. Um, I will introduce you up. If you want to uh, ask to come up, just go ahead and uh, click the button at the bottom and uh, raise your hand and I can bring you up to stage. Uh, it's pretty relaxed, pretty laid back, no pressure. So um, otherwise you can stay in the audience. We are streaming on beam.xyz. Uh, you can go to Titan Node's Twitter where you can watch this live stream as it's happening. You can also make comments in the live stream where um, I can take your questions and answer them uh, as we go. So uh, without further ado, we will start with the regular introductions and a topic. So if you have a topic, think of it now um, and um, yeah, we'll go through those. So uh, hello everyone, I'm Titan Node. I run the Titan Node Orchestrator Pool, been operating since May of 2021. And um, I guess it's April, I don't know if it's April or May. Uh, but uh, today's topic um, is uh, going to be about, um, again, NetInt cards versus um, NVIDIA cards. And also the, um, the new, what is it, the A16 card NVIDIA put out, the new Tesla card uh, that has four encoding chips and eight decoding chips. Um, and it's for the low, 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 low price of uh, $3,900. Um, I'm really curious as to how we can get our hands on those. So just kind of curious about that and uh, kind of trying to figure out how to build the Titan node miner. So again, my topic is about ASIC cards. Um, so we'll move on to Authority Null. Uh, Authority, would you like to introduce yourself and a topic? Hey guys, Authority Null here. Been transcoding since November last year. Uh, topic, uh, don't really have a specific one. I, I guess if anyone had any more information on Theta and what those guys are working on um, and how it compares since they are technically a direct competitor now, um, that would be cool to talk about. But really, I'm just mostly interested to hear what Tom's been working on. Very cool. Yeah, Theta is an interesting project, and um, I'm <laughs> I did make a video on that, and it was like totally like I got like backlash for it because everyone's like you didn't really talk about it, and I'm like okay, I should probably do some more research. Uh, but yes, thank you very much for joining us, Authority Papa Bear. Would you like to introduce yourself and a topic? Sure, I am Papa Bear, and I have been running Solar Farms since. Um... It was July of uh, 2021, so I think technically it's about a year now. And um, my, it's funny, my topic was the uh, topic I brought up last week, which is I think how we ended up getting Tom in here. And I can't find my notes from last week, but basically it was around um, the, uh, the low latency stuff that's being worked on and uh, Miss Server and how that might affect us as orchestrators um if um, i think there's something about that the routing may bypass the orchestrator or because to be more direct for low latency i'm just kind of curious to know um how that's all working and um i'll i'll, I'll come up with a, a smoother question and uh when you come back around to me but that's the the basic thing is around mist servers um low latency and um, um efficiency um of possibly having less hops through the um, the network to get to the uh, low latency stuff. Very cool. Yeah, I'm curious to hear about that as well. I know that that was a topic in Discord, so we'll definitely get into that as well. Thank you very much for joining us, Papa Bear. Tom, would you like to introduce introduce yourself and a topic? Sure. I'm Tom. Um, I run the video team at Live Bear, uh, and I'm I'm going to be here to I guess talk about myself a little bit, talk about what we're working on. Uh, answer any questions people have, and then talk a little bit about um, like less technical projects we have in the work as well, it works as well around like how we can engage better with the orchestrator community, uh, bits and pieces like that. Very cool. Yeah, great to have you, Tom. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited for this Q&A. Um, and um, I'm sure as more people show up, um, there will be more questions. So if you have a question for Tom, please put it in the back of your head because when I come around to you, Hey, interpreter, do you mind? I'm speaking. Um, 
uh, well, that's right next into a segue. I was saying, if you are um, have a question for Tom, go ahead and write it down, and uh, we'll jump into it a little bit later. Uh, with that uh, being said, Interpreter, would you like to introduce yourself on a topic? Hi there, uh, Interpreter here, transcoding for the last, uh, what, 14 months or so. I'm feeling a bit under the weather, so I'll probably just be listening in here, but good to finally be here. I think this time works a bit better for me. Very cool. Thank you so much for joining us. And by the way, you sound amazing. Did you get a new microphone or something? Oh, it's uh, surprisingly just a cheap set of earbuds. Well, I must say you sound uh, pretty damn good. So uh, great to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, cool. Okay. Well, well, as more people come in, we'll uh, continue to introduce them. But um, yeah, let's jump into some of the topics uh, around today. So Authority, you talked about um, uh, Theta. Um, what is your question about Theta? What, have you done any research into this? We'll jump into that topic first. I just started doing a bit of research. Uh, I've been looking at their Discord community. They seem to have a, a really passionate community behind them as well. Um, I, don't, I don't really have a specific question. It's more about how they're going about things and, and how that could be made difficult for Lypeer, for example. I don't know exactly how that works, but I know they like patenting pretty much everything they do. Um, so I'm just curious, like, since LivePeer's code is all open source, what's stopping a company like Theta from just taking the code and tweaking it a bit and then putting a patent on it? And then LivePeer is potentially in some legal trouble. Yeah, so I have a bit to say about that because I have done a little bit of work into um, LivePeer or sorry, Theta. Um, so uh, first of all, I will direct you to the Q&A uh, session with uh, Doug, where I asked Doug about Theta, and he gave a nice uh, nice answer. So it's on my YouTube. I would highly check it out. Um, it's yeah, where... I, think I've, I think I've seen it, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one, that one, I think Doug gives a more elegant answer to the question that I tried to answer, um, where I was just maybe trying to get more clickbait on my uh, YouTube channel by being like, oh, Theta versus Livepeer. Um, but Doug actually had like a good answer, which was like they, Theta and Livepeer took two very different approaches um, to a similar problem. But like Livepeer or Theta focused on the content delivery network first and Livepeer focused on the video transcoding first. Um, and so Live Peer, uh, Theta has quote unquote fixed the content delivery network problem um, by partnering with very large companies and they have, I think, 12 patents now. Um, yeah, so they have like a different style of doing their whole project to begin with. Um, and then they just recently added transcoding on top um, as like a an add-on kind of thing you can do. And I've tried to transcode on Theta and it was kind of weird, like it didn't work. Like I just, it would try to transcode the video and it would just error out. Um, and I couldn't figure out why or how, but, and the video that I was transcoding, I'd, I'd only get one session like every once in a while. And even then it just didn't work. So I'm not too sure if I was doing something wrong, but it, the software itself didn't seem very stable to me um, because it was like a whole GUI too. like. You had to transcode while watching other people's streams. Like it wasn't like you can run just back end stuff. You had to actually like watch people's streams or something. Um so interesting. Yeah. I I've tried to use Theta and um it seemed fine. It was basically like Twitch, but like "Quote unquote decentralized," but you couldn't really feel it because there's nothing you could see on the back end. That's my experience with Theta. Does anyone else have any experience with Theta? I, I have a comment about patents, if you like. Yes, Alex, please. please go ahead. So, so when we create something open source and uh, regarding patents, it's considered published. So you cannot patent it as it's it's uh, not new. It's already known. Ah, uh, okay. That's refreshing to hear. So can you elaborate just on that a little bit? So when you say you can't 
are you saying you can't patent an open source pro like open source code is that what you're saying well in, in a lot of countries you cannot uh, patent a code but you can patent methods that are described in code right and when you're preparing to uh, to file a patent uh, you uh, you cannot you must rest, re restrain yourself from publishing the the methods right so you you first need to patent to f file a patent and you then get a date from which the uh, your patent is expiring and ca counted as start date right and then uh, you can publish it i think uh, uh, 6 months later from uh, patent date so uh, if you publish something and then file patent for it, uh, you yourself would be uh, killing your own patent. So uh, for something to be pat uh, included in your patent and recognized as your patent, it needs to be innovative. So no one else uh, needs, uh, no one else, if someone else uh, publishes the same method, you cannot patent it, including yourself. So. You, I think there is uh, one exception uh, regarding uh, some trade shows and stuff like that. But uh, if something is open source like Linux kernel, it's all open source. All the methods within it and described within it are considered published. So no patents on it can be, can be done. So right. it's not, it's not uh, who files first for a patent and grabs the IP. It's who creates the IP and then files a button. Okay, so if if Theta is has you know eight, they they claim to have I think eight to twelve patents, that would mean that that is not open source because they would essentially kill their own patent. Then is that what you're kind of referring to? Well, what they can do is file a patent, and then when patent is recognized, right, then they can make it open source. And if you use it in, in your, uh, for your profit, they can sue you. Yeah, that sounds ridiculous. Like, I don't, I don't understand how... See, that was one of my things I covered in my video was I, I don't understand how patents really work in the, the Web3 world. Like, it doesn't... It seems to go against the ethos of what Web3 stands for, right? Um, Obviously. Yes, but they, they, uh, it's not an obstacle for someone to uh, file a patent and then sue you. Uh, it's regardless uh, whether it respects the etiquette, right? It's a matter of law. Yeah. That's, that's what confused me as well, is they kind of just seem like a Web2 project with their own blockchain. And no disrespect to them at all, it just seems like they're so centralized at this point that it's not really like a decentralized crypto tagline thing. Well, that might be true because I know like Grayscale um, and a lot of um, the institutions skipped Theta. Um, they, they went to, well, they went to Livepeer, but they skipped Theta and they skipped um, a couple other uh, video platforms. Or they, they try and skip platforms that are, that have patents or that are basically top down you know, like, and so I feel like, I feel like Theta is going to succeed technologically because they are like built by YouTube and Twitch and like, they will probably provide a good service, but like, because it's still just kind of web too, right? Like, <laughs> like, you know, the, the, the hard part about building web three infrastructure is that you have to make it permissionless or you know decentralized or you know pick, pick your fancy word but like i feel like theta can probably probably censor you by the feel of it so yeah yeah any other comments on on theta um anyone or or um yeah anything on that topic like i said i i I messed around with it in the early days and um I didn't uh I didn't see I, I I didn't really enjoy trying to actually use it. Um another comment I got from um Thull with uh, Miss Server was that he doesn't understand why they didn't go with like a web for a web a browser first approach like 
if you want to use the theta like um tv app you have to download it on your computer and then use it and like you can't just watch theta enabled stuff through your browser um which he thought was kind of ridiculous like just like Papa Bear doesn't want to download an app on his phone to watch this live through live I was stream. About to say that that cuts me out of it. I'm not doing it. Like like people these days like super don't want to download anything. Like 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 more than ever, nobody wants to download an app. Nobody wants to download an application. Like people are like browser first. Like like just let it work, right? And um, Theta didn't take that approach, so. That was really interesting. That was his comment on that. And then the other um, comment was, um, who is it from? Oh, I can't remember now. I, it, it, someone else made an interesting comment, but yeah, I, it's interesting. Um, I've tried you remember to the comment or just, oh, this or, is or it. Oh yeah. It, yeah. The, the founders of a media network. Um, so they're building a decentralized content delivery network, uh, DCDN, and I had an interview with the founder there, and I asked him about Theta. I said, you know, doesn't Theta do exactly what you're trying to do? And he goes, the 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 inspiration they got for building um, media network was because they were unable to build anything on top of Theta, like. They actually tried to build something on top of Theta, and they basically couldn't. Like, there were too many, just too much red tape. Like, it wasn't, you, you couldn't actually build your own thing on top of Theta. You could only kind of just create content on top of their platform. And so he was like, well, this doesn't really feel like infrastructure. This just feels like an app. Um, and so he, they got inspired to build a truly decentralized permissionless um content delivery network similar to the way you know live peer operates where it's just an underlying infrastructure there's no competing apps and you can build on top of it however you like right um so his experience was he tried to build something on top of theater and like actually couldn't um so which somehow doesn't surprise me um doug also mentioned that in the q a which is I'm not sure why the Theta network competes with its customers or its builders that would build on top of it. Like that was one thing he's like, that's why LivePeer doesn't have its own app is because it doesn't want to try and compete with people that want to build on top of it because that's not what it is. So anyway, those, those, are, those are the comments I've heard from people um, and the experience with it. Does that does that help at all? Is that is that new information to anyone? Is that helpful? Yeah, that was that was pretty helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm other than knowing of Theta, I have no experience with it. So yeah, I, it, it gives me uh, just some idea of what's going on over there. Um, yeah, that's helpful. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, it's an interesting topic, but we'll we'll probably come back to it some later time. Uh, we have two new people in here. Alex. Alex. Uh, Hevik. Hevik. I don't know how I say your last name. Hevik. Um, would you like to introduce yourself and a topic you might have? Oh, sure. So I'm a developer at LivePeer. And uh, currently I'm doing a low latency improvement. So uh, we can uh, transcode or process live streams with minimal latency. And actually, I don't have any topic in mind. Very cool. Thank you so much for joining us, Alex. Uh, oh, and Alex again with Sharing Snode. Alex, would you like to introduce yourself on a topic? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I'm a TPM at Life here, uh, focusing on orchestrator platform stuff. Um, I don't have any major topics today. It's cool that uh, Tom is here. Um, he's someone I work with, and uh, he's pretty integral to a lot of the, the big features coming out soon. Um, yeah, and I guess uh, if anyone has opinions or... Uh, ideas as to how they would like to improve uh, key management, whether that means uh, how you receive rewards or how um, that ETH account is sort of tied to your orchestrator node. Um, I'm starting to look into improvements there. So if there are comments or suggestions, uh, that could be interesting to talk about. But um, otherwise, that's um, about it for me. 
Thank you so much for joining us, Alex. Um, yes, key management. I am very curious about that topic. Um, would love to see if we can integrate some sort of like um, Shamir secret uh, key mat key uh, creation or something like that. Um, some sort, yeah. Improved key security is like probably a pretty big topic for me because I don't think uh, Live Peer natively does good key management. It just kind of creates it out of thin air on a computer. I'll second that. Sounds good. I'm sure other people. I'm sure other people yeah, think, have similar feelings. Yeah, and we've already had an experience with one orchestrator going down because of that. Um, but yeah, hey, I think there'll be a lot of. But it's also like a, a bit of a complicated topic. So uh, I will def would definitely jump into that later on. Cool. Okay. Well. It's uh it's eight thirty now. We uh, we do have Tom here, and um, we've got um, uh, people still joining us and watching us on live stream as well. So why don't we go ahead and start with our Q and A session, um, where we can uh, ask Tom a little bit about um, his uh, his experience with Live Peer and uh, get his uh, his introduction and uh, and do a Q and A session. So Tom, if you're ready, um, I would like to kick us off with uh, today's guest Q and A. Uh, member, uh, which is Tom with Live Peer. So, Tom, uh, I will start you off. Um, tell us a little bit about um, who you are and uh, and what work you do with Live Peer. And then I have about four or five questions we can go through. But um, if anyone at any point wants to jump in with a question um, in between, just uh, go ahead and uh, and pop in and ask Tom your question. So, Tom, start us off. Um, you know what you're working on with Live Peer and who you are. Sure. Thanks, Titan. Um, so I'm Tom. I've been at LivePeer for two or three months now. Uh, my background is in video. So I've worked at the BBC and a company called Brico, primarily uh, working on the ingestion pipelines and um, a lot of focus on delivery over HTTP at scale. So being able to stream stuff out globally quickly and reliably, like on the order of tens, hundreds of thousands of requests a second. Um, so that's also kind of what I'm focusing on at LivePeer. I'm running the video transcoding team. Um, so all the crypto side is new to me. So that's been kind of a steep learning curve. That's been um, taking up a decent chunk of my time over the past couple of months, just trying to understand all of that. Um, and then in terms of what I'm working on at the moment, um, the big projects we've got are low latency. So rather than low latency in like any formal, uh, like low latency HLS sense, it's more looking at ways we can reduce that end-to-end -end latency from the point at which the video comes in from a streamer to the point at which we pass a transcoded version back out. Um, so I think I heard there are some questions around that. So we can we can dive into how that's looking a little bit. Um, I'm also working on fast verification, so getting that rolled out to production so that we can begin uh, by the process of automatically verifying segments that the transcoders are producing. Um, I'm also looking at image thumbnails at the moment, which is looking like it's going to be in the form of uh, the transcoders producing a stream of keyframes. So you get a, an extra transcoded video stream that's just a bunch of keyframes. And then it's kind of up to Mist or the player to figure out how they want to parse that and what they want to do with that set of uh, set of images. And then the other piece I'm looking at at the moment is um, I'm working with Alex uh, on the um, opt-in metrics for orchestrators. So we're looking at like which metrics can orchestrators opt in to exposing to us, uh, like how we can do that securely, how we can maintain orchestrator privacy all that kind of stuff uh yeah so i'm i'm uh working on that with alex at the moment trying to figure out exactly what that should look like so yeah that's it i'm happy to i, I mean i'm also doing a bunch of stuff that we can talk about in a bit around like um broader community issues right so so how my team can engage better with orchestrators how we can provide a better orchestrator experience in general in terms of releases upgrades testing um but yeah, like may maybe first we can dive into the projects I'm working on and questions people have around that. 
Very cool. Yes, that uh, that sounds amazing and, and great introduction and, and uh, really wonderful to have you here. Um, let's let's start off with uh, some questions from uh, everyone else. Um, does anyone have any questions about the low latency um, uh, topic? Yeah, I do. Um, so can you just kind of walk us through, and I, I guess this probably, I, I guess in general, but also I guess uh, where I started reading about it in GitHub was uh, with Mist. Um, what's the, uh, can you just kind of give us like the high level of like, how, what's the stream flow going to look like um, in the future? I do. You, I mean, is it going to change where it goes broadcaster, orchestrator, uh, transcoder, transcoder, orchestrator, broadcaster? Yeah, sure. But yeah, that's a good starting point. So, and that that was really in flux until um, last week. We've been trying out a bunch of little proof of concepts and um, different architectural ideas. And so, yeah, one of them was going to alter that fundamental flow right, that everyone's used to of broadcaster, orchestrator, transcoder, and back out again. One of the things we were looking at was, can we keep that for the data, like the control flow, but then just stream video directly from MIST to the transcoder and back out again? Um, which I, I think would have been technically doable, but would have pushed a lot of complexity into like that messaging layer to try and maintain um, all the properties that we want around being up to sign segments, like all that security data integrity side of things. So what we're actually going with is we're going to keep the, um, the standard BOT workflow. And we're just going to initially focus on any points in that pipeline where we're waiting for an entire segment, right? So there's a few kind of choke points at the moment where, for, for example, for verification, we wait for the whole segment to be available, analyze it, and then return a result of whether it's uh, verification was successful or not. And there's a few different examples of that throughout the workflow. So we're going to be keeping the concept of segments. Um, we're going to be keeping the concept of broadcaster, orchestrator, transcoder flow. But we're just going to be, wherever possible, either operating on the first frame of video, for example. So like if we can do some verification just as soon as we receive that first keyframe, or we're also looking at ways of um, moving to like a true streaming workflow. So we, like the broadcaster gets the first frame of video and immediately passes it onto the orchestrator without waiting for the entire segment, um, that kind of thing. Okay, so from, okay, that, that sounds um, diff different than what I was thinking, what I, what I was reading um, in the GitHub last week, so. Um, I, yeah, I thought you guys were gonna move to like a more of a metadata kind of thing, and um, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, interesting to hear that. Um, yeah, and then like I said, we we that was something we looked into, but yeah, I think with the flow we're going for, nothing visible is going to change for orchestrators. And do you have like a like uh, how much how much better do you think latency will be, um, or do you not know yet? Uh yeah, it's it's hard to tell exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of I factors, of course. Yeah, I would think like hopefully at least a segment better of latency. So we still like bottlenecks are still going to be, um, for example, players will generally want three segments of buffer before they'll start playing back. Um, but yeah, at the moment in the pipeline at the moment, we've got like essentially a full segment or worse of latency because of these points where we wait for the whole thing. So. Yeah, for for example, with two second segments, I would hope we're shaving off at least two se seconds, if not more. Cool. Um, then I had another question, which probably doesn't um, is probably no longer valid based on what you're saying, because I saw there was something where they were talking about payments um, are currently per segment, and then um, like it was talking about how payments would work. Um, I guess to, mm -hmm. to um, for orchestrators, um, if you switch to more of a streaming. Um, uh, protocol or you know or you're doing streaming um, the whole i guess video versus segments but it mm -hmm. sounds like so you'll be sticking with segments um so that's not yeah an issue right and that was one of the reasons right um at least for this initial phase we want to keep the concept of segments just because so much like payments and verification and all these different pieces are built around the segment concept so it's almost like we're doing sub segment streaming but we're still keeping that high level yeah the high level concept of a segment and then just the key related, related oh. to that 
Um, the, what I thought was interesting because it, it says, you know, payments are, are per segment, but technically they're per pixel. But so is it per pixel per segment? Is that what it, what it, what it's really talking about? Because um, I mean, it's, it's technically mm -hmm. it's per pixel that we I mean, that's what we charge is, is orchestrators, right? Is that it is? Yeah, that's, that's true. But um, just a lot of the in terms of how that's calculated and like in terms of how our code thinks about things, it's a lot of stuff just operates on, yeah, on this segment level, even if segment. you're being paid per, per pixel. Got it. And then uh, if, if, it, if it's okay, if I ask one more. Yeah, um, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, I was curious about the like the the ETE stuff that's going on. Like, are, there's I know there's these um, test streams that are being sent out now. Like, there's like the the 147 segment um, tests. What kind of things are you uh, looking for in those tests? Or what are you What are you helping to learn from that? Yeah, so the end to end tests are trying to improve stability right through fixing like. Kind of fixing this gap in our testing where we're testing we've got good unit testing we're testing all the components individually but then we're slightly reliant on deploying everything to staging and then either relying on the um regular test streams that we do or on manual testing to test whether it actually all hooks together properly um so the end-to-end -end tests are more I, and i think rafael's coming next week right he's been driving a lot of this so he could probably talk in a little more detail but it's um it's not just going to be using the network it's more like trying to figure out a way that we can locally test all of our components together and start writing tests start writing automated tests at that level to catch issues with uh like i know the broadcaster and the orchestrator talking to each other um things like that okay so and, and so they're really it's um it's more really, uh, sorry, to checking, trying to figure out like, um, I guess, stability and things like that, rather than mm -hmm. replacing the current um, performance um, metrics that are, that are used in the, the, I guess, just the general test streams that we get now. Yeah, that's right. It's yeah meant to be more internally facing, uh, like stability, reliability improvements, rather than anything that ties into the network. Got it. Um, I do have another question, but I'll let anyone else jump in if they want to go. I mean, this, this one's getting into some other stuff down the road kind of stuff, but um, does anyone else want to jump in? Sure. We'll see if uh, anyone else has any questions. Uh, uh, I'll come uh, back around to you, Papa Bear, of course. Uh, sure. Does anyone else have any questions for Tom at this point? Um, it's been talked about a little bit on, on the forums. I'm curious uh, with, with fast verification if that plays a role into the selection algorithm for orchestrators as well, or if it's its, uh, its own thing completely? Yeah, so initially it won't be. Um, initially, I think we're just, if fast verification fails, we switch orchestrator, right? Um, I think beyond that, though, we're looking at like the concept of full verification, so uh, like an out-of-band, async, deeper set of checks. Um, and yeah, then like I think also beyond that, one of the things we're going to be looking at is what do we want? What else do we want to do with this data? Is there anything else, like can we feed it back into the network or um, yeah, what else do we want to do with it? But I think at the moment there aren't any concrete plans. It's just kind of an open open question. Awesome, thank you. I have a question about uh, stream quality versus security. Um, in your opinion, Tom, what what is more important, um, the the quality of the stream or the security of making sure that the the stream is correct coming back through a decentralized network? Like, what 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 does the team optimize for? That's a really good question because I think like instinctively those two things aren't um, don't act in opposition to each other, right? Like you should be able to have a high quality stream. But yeah, it, with things like fast verification, it, because it's it needs some amount of data to operate on, even if that's just a frame, that will become more complex with the stream quality increases. Um, I think, yeah, it it kind of depends, right? I've, we've been discussing this recently, like how optimistic we want to be with, um, let's say, say 
fast verification, we can run it per X segments. And so we could run it once every five minutes. And realistically, I think in the real world, that, that would be enough if it's going to catch anyone deliberately misbehaving in terms of the results they're producing. Um, I would think cases of accidentally producing bad results are going to be relatively rare. Um, but probably we want to do it more frequently than that just to catch catch problems more quickly. Um, so yeah, I, there's no real answer to that other than it's a sliding scale that we're probably going to be playing around with as we roll out these features. And as we start seeing more and more people wanting to do high quality video and putting more strain on the network in that sense. So yeah, it, it's a slider and we're going to be playing with it and seeing seeing what works. And and for for the uh, the stream again for the stream quality versus stream security like do you believe that it is possible to um, I guess uh, skip the B and O or, or some in in some case you know directly work with the T the transcoder and and back to you know wherever it needs to go without having to send segments through or do you think that's going to be an inevitability of just how things work. I think it's it's possible, but it'll be. I think it's probably not an optimization we need at the moment. Right? It's going to be at a higher scale and further down the line. We could probably send some subset of the segments directly or some amount of data directly. But yeah, like just in terms of like we've been talking about these optimizations of not having things wait for a whole segment. Uh, the latency involved in that is just dwarfs the latency of these network hops, right? Because the networks we're using are quick. Things are located close to each other. Um, I think the benefits we'd get from having a more direct, like broadcast the direct transcoder, for example, or missed direct transcoder, will be small enough. It's not worth the complexity at the moment. Great. So what? It, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna hop into another question yet. Um, so you know, say you know you have experience with um, big big broadcasting, large amounts of um, network traffic for streams. Um, if I if I'm not mistaken, that's what you said earlier, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You you know we have. Let, I want to take an example. How close do transcoders need to be to? Um, to broadcasters or to miss server locations um do you think for for an optimal network going into the future like like let, let's let's take the continental united states you know we have kind of like a, a we have a broadcaster on on los angeles and then on the other side of the country of a, a broadcaster in new york in europe we have you know london and frankfurt you know are, is it all right to have these distances for transcoders or does it have to be much tighter like do we have to have you know 20 different locations that are you know within five milliseconds um throughout europe or are we okay with these more more spread out nodes do you think for mm -hmm. performance yeah that's a good question so yeah obviously like for optimal performance you'd want to be as close as possible but um I think the problems that will come up as we scale aren't going to be on that ingestion transcoding side, right? Like if, if we have an extra hundred milliseconds on the transcode pipeline, it's not the end of the world, but like if we're operating at a huge scale, um, it's going to be more, how quickly can we get that stuff out to CDNs? How can, like, how can we get really good global CDN coverage? How can um, we fail over CDNs when they're not performing well? How can we route? people in difficult geographic locations to the right place. Um, and then also, I guess also around like the ingest side, like how can we have good failover? Um, so when someone's doing a really big high stakes uh, event, like how can these broadcasters be doing multiple ingests at the same time and flip between those as needed or automatically fail over between those. I think that those are the kind of problems we'll hit at scale rather than like, can we get the transcoder a um, hundred miles closer to the, to the broadcaster? 
Right, because th- this has been an interesting thing. Like, like, um, uh, over on the west coast here, you know, I'm I, I was getting lots of uh, transcoding work from New York and 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 Chicago, which is coming ac- almost across the continent, but I was transcoding it and sending it back in real time, and you know that didn't it didn't seem mm-hmm. to be an issue to hold the stream. So what you're saying is the distance between the transcoder and the broadcasters and the amount of hops in between is probably not the biggest issue. The other is, you know, reliability, redundancy, and and content delivery network kind of stuff. Is that what you're saying? That, that would be my take, yeah. Like, I think especially in the um, regions most of you are operating in, like you spoke about, getting from one coast of the U.S. to the other is relatively stable, relatively quick. I think it does become more interesting as if, we were to start transcoding more in, um, like, say, South America, Southeast Asia. But, yeah, I think um, if we're going coast to coast, for example, and adding 100 milliseconds, it just means that um, playback is 100 milliseconds further away from the true live, like the head of the stream, which for most use cases isn't the end of the world. Very cool. Does anyone else have any questions for Tom? I have like five more new ones, but uh, I, I, yeah, go I've ahead. Got, I've, got, I've got one. I'm not um, 100% sure this is um, something that Tom's would, would is working on or would, uh, would be the one that's working on, but um, something that's just um, uh, it just been in the back of my mind for, for months is with um, different generations of NVIDIA cards um, that you, um, having different uh, encode and decode uh, capabilities and better quality as the uh, newer generation cards. Um, we're currently using the same profile for, it doesn't matter what card you have, it's just like, oh, got your NVIDIA, you're getting you know this profile. Um, is there any um, thought of on um, optimizing for the actual hardware? Um, it, 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 I guess at a very like it, minimal level, just like, oh, this is a six gen chip versus going to a four gen chip. Um, they can both do the same uh, quality, but uh, uh, like a, a, a newer chip can do the same quality as an older card at medium um, or versus like high quality or something like that. Where, because I feel like a lot of people are shying away from some of the newer cards because the older cards are performing better. Um, uh, mm-hmm. When the newer cards can actually uh transcode faster um if if they if they had different settings on them and get the same quality out of them Does that makes sense yeah I, I don't know yeah that's a really good question and yeah that is we've got one person focusing full time on exactly that problem at the moment so like it came up a little bit with the netint thing right now we're supporting nvidia and netint cards it, it's become really clear that like even just for those cases having this generic one size fits all type approach doesn't really make the best use of the hardware. So what we're doing at the moment is there's a bit of refactoring going on and a bit of reworking to get that low level code into a good place where we can begin then um, doing more per card type stuff, like really interfacing directly with the cards and making better use of um, yeah, like the different abilities they all have. Awesome. I've, I've, been, I've been wanting that for a while, so I'm glad to hear that it's, uh, it's on the radar. Thanks. Nice. You you brought up. Um, we'll we'll do a little more technical questions, and then I'll, I'll I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom back out because I have some more broad questions um, um, that uh, that I want to go through. But um, you know, like uh, continuing on with the the and uh, the uh, ASIC cards because that's something I've been interested in is. Is it difficult for Live Peer to integrate like the new Intel ASIC chip cards? Is it going to be? Is Live Peer planning or want to be the, you know, to be able to support lots and lots of different cards, or is it more important you think to, to pick a a more specific hardware type, focus on them, do them really well, and uh, and and use them to their best abilities. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, my take would be the latter. I mean, yeah, it's a little bit of a like high-level company strategy 
question right. But my, my take would be I'd rather see us targeting some the most common pieces of commodity hardware and doing a really good job of like getting the maximum performance we can out of them. Um, and then, yeah, I think it would be good to have like a, a more generic wide support, but um, yeah, like I'd like to focus focus on um, specific cards and try and get get the best out of them if possible. Definitely. Does anyone have any more technical questions for uh, for Tom? Very cool. Um, I want to I want to wrap back around. Um, you kind of mentioned in your introduction, you know, you wanted to um, find ways to engage with orchestrators. What what um, what from your end uh, from from the core team? What what do you want or want to achieve by by uh, by engaging with the orchestrators and and how do you yeah what what do you want to achieve and how do you think that would look? Yeah, so I think um, at the moment there's a little bit of a disconnect between how the orchestrators use our stuff and um, like my team's understanding of it. So my team are very much down in the weeds of like transcoder level, writing this code, um, but don't have a ton of experience in terms of like uh, just running running the binary, even like using the command line options, um, how it all ties in with the blockchain side of things. Uh, like key management is a really good example of something I would guess nobody on my team really has a good picture of what people are doing. Um, so I'd like to, and even though in some cases that doesn't affect what we do too much, like we can happily keep writing this code to uh, interface better with NVIDIA cards without worrying about that stuff. Um, I think a lot of the time it should inform what we do a little more than it currently does. And so, yeah, that's that. That would be my main goal: is to just um, make sure what we're building is useful and usable by the orchestrators. Yeah, that's that's very interesting, and I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up. That was one of the uh, inspirations for um, for inviting. You know, I tr tried to do Q and As where we can get the core dev team to come in and and have this discussion with us because. Um, the the water cooler chat is a place where orchestrators typically come and um and a lot of us actually are from the crypto side i, I am myself uh i know uh, quite a few other people are as well so uh it's very cool to see that that linking together of uh, of the two sides uh, mm -hmm. so um you know uh from from uh i guess from the uh, where was i going with this question um, you know what? I, I totally forgot the next question I was going to ask, so I'm just going to skip that one and go to the next one. Um, from a broad overview of um, of your time with LivePeer, what has been the most um, interesting uh, thing that you've been working on since you you uh, started with LivePeer? Um, that's a good question. For me personally, I've found just the whole blockchain crypto side super interesting. Like just in terms of like it's a completely different culture um i enjoyed working in the open like working on this fully open source thing that's been interesting as well just getting used to like for example with this low latency thing right um having a discussion in the open and then having you guys asking questions about it is it's uh that's kind of interesting um and then the, like the verification project has been interesting uh, i think anything like quite often um, I'll be designing something or working on like an architecture and then I have to readjust what I'm doing based on the fact that, oh, this isn't just going to be running on one box that I can control somewhere, right? This is going to be out there in the wild. We're going to have to think about like backwards compatibility and upgrade paths because we can't just upgrade every orchestrator simultaneously. Um, so yeah, just, just working on something distributed at this scale has been interesting as well. Very cool. How did you discover LivePeer? <laughs> um, a recruiter got in touch with me. <laughs> it's not the most interesting story, but I, I looked into it. And so I'd always been like, I was initially fairly skeptical of Web3 blockchain type stuff, right? Just because of the, which I, I think I still think is the case, like the amount of um, 
I guess, grift in the community or like the amount of sketchy product projects and things like that. But um, I was attracted to live beer because they were, they're building something concrete, right? It's not an abstract building block of Web3 or like um, just a tool for Web3 builders. It's like something that's available to traditional Web2 people that just want to transcode video cheaply um, as well as being integrated with this whole Web3 world. Um, so I really like that. Like it's a, a concrete, useful thing. I love the idea of uh, getting people less dependent on the big cloud providers. So people being able to do transcoding without relying on AWS, Google Cloud, and stuff like that. After, I mean, after working with those those companies for a long time, um, I think anything that can move people away from them from that duopoly is really good. Um, so yeah, those were the main things that attracted me about live peer versus just going and working for another video company and building out like another iteration of the web two stuff I've been working on. Yeah, it's very interesting for you to say, yeah, crypto can sometimes have a, a an interesting slant on it where you hear about all the NFT rug pulls and ICO rug mm -hmm. pulls and and then you think, what is this this thing that everyone's losing all their money and and um and it can be very uh you know, it could be very easy to be skeptical of it. Um, but then mm -hmm. when you come across certain projects that you think, wow, this actually has interesting use cases. And so um, I'm glad I'm glad they reached out to you and, and, uh, and got you on board. What has been what has been the most challenging thing you've worked on so far? Um, I think the low latency stuff just in terms of like having to get to grips with the whole stack end to end um, and particularly like how it relates to payments and the blockchain side and all these other components of the flow beyond just like having to step outside that comfort zone of video streaming. Um, so yeah, that in addition to like really, really starting from scratch with, um, with the web three stuff, I think that's been the biggest, biggest challenge. Very cool. Any other questions for Tom? Don't be shy. I'm sure somebody has some questions. I can talk a little bit about um, like the plans I have for community engagement, if you like, and then maybe people will have questions off the back of that. Yes, please do. Talk about uh, community engagement and uh, what you have for, uh, for that. Sure. So, I mean, it's nothing too crazy or groundbreaking, but um, we started as a team doing regular issue triage rather than, I feel like it was a little ad hoc before. So now we're doing every week, sitting down as a team, looking at issues people have raised on the GitHub over the past week, actually assigning them to someone, um, making time for them to be fixed or closed. Uh, similarly, every Friday now we're doing bug fix Fridays, just because of this backlog we built up of um, community issues. So every Friday, everyone on the team takes an issue off the GitHub uh, backlog, tries to fix it or close it. Um, that was all. That also kind of ties into, so uh, one of the other adjustments that's been difficult for me is I'd been working on SaaS products before, right? software as a service where we more or less are just continuously deploying, like five, 10 times a day, even within a team. You write some code, you get it reviewed, you test it, you push it out to production. Um, and if it goes wrong, you just quickly roll it back. Um, whereas it's kind of because we're deploying to community orchestrators, it's a much slower like release, uh, get feedback cycle. And so I wanted to try and speed that up a little bit like within the constraints of that and move to maybe a weekly or fortnightly release. Um, and so that was kind of interesting after talking to Alex and Marco and a few of the orchestrators in the community, it seems like people weren't actually super keen on that just because of the work that's involved at the moment in upgrading a node um, and testing it and the lack of um, like graceful shutdown. So just stopping accepting any new streams, waiting for the current ones to finish updating and then uh, starting up again is a really manual process at the moment. Um, so yeah, like that one thing we're going to do obviously is to work on, work on that 
uh, infrastructure side of things. So making the upgrade path a lot smoother. But then also, yeah, hopefully these, by fixing a bunch of these community issues and actually addressing the stuff people are raising, um, it'll mean each release has a nice amount of concrete stuff like improvements to the CLI or little bug fixes and things to improve the orchestrator experience enough each time that it makes it worthwhile for you to upgrade. It's not just some like abstract performance refactorings we've done. So that's another of the big thing. And then um, the other main thing I'm focusing on at the moment is like uh, dog fooding and testing. So I'm playing around with some ideas of how we can get people on my team to maybe not run like a formal full orchestrator node, but to m simulate better the uh, real world experience you guys are having of running a node. Um, and to make that part of our onboarding process as well, when we bring new people on to get them some hardware and get them set up with like to get them a better picture of like what it looks like to run a node and um, deal with the payment side and deal with the monitoring, all, all that side of stuff, uh, just so they have more of a, a real world picture in the back of their mind as they're working on features. Yep. So yeah, I, think, I think those are all the main strands, but yeah, I'm happy to take questions on those as well. The, um, the 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 faster feedback the, the bug fix Fridays and and the the uh, the meetings you have for um, for fixing mm -hmm. things is this is this open for people for anyone to come or is this an internal meeting? Um, uh, yeah, so these are just internal, but um, like you'll hopefully start see, you'll see the the results of this on the GitHub. Like any issues you're subscribed to or any issues you add to the GitHub each week, you'll you'll start seeing more immediate feedback on those is there um, and then in terms of the bug fixes like each, each release i'll i'll make sure we tag like list out which issues we've been fixing each release it, i was going to say i can attest to that i i, I put in a, a an issue request on i think it might have been on friday or maybe mm -hmm. it was thursday and um it was addressed uh, the next day or maybe even the same day. And um, it, it, I saw this morning that it's being worked on. So um, awesome. <laughs> it's, it yeah. seems to be working really fast. Yeah. So yeah, I, guess that's, like, I, guess, I guess I'm trying to encourage other uh, orchestrators. If, if there's something you want, <laughs> make, make, make a GitHub request. Yeah, for sure. Because, yeah, I really don't want people to just give up on raising issues. Right? Um, it's really useful feedback. And also, I just from looking at the types of issues we've been we've got, and in, that are sitting in the backlog, like a lot of it is um, real low hanging fruit, like just issues around CLI parsing and uh, bits and pieces like that, where it's obviously like a big pain point for running a node, but it's it's a really easy fix for us to just go and sort out. So yeah, there's a lot of potential there, I think. Very cool. I, you talked about this uh, faster feedback cycle. Would you be open to allowing that meeting where you talk about bug fixes or you talk about, like, would you be open to having outsiders come in and, and join in on that discussion or at least listen? Like, I know it's it's with mm -hmm. your core team, but mm -hmm. is that something you'd be open to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just in Discord at the moment, but we can look at moving it to a public channel for sure. There's nothing... Um, secret happening in there so yeah i can try that from this week we'll do it in either make a new channel or just do it in one of the existing public channels definitely and and this is this just a a, a, a written conversation or is this um uh, an audio or video or how how do you guys normally do this yeah just be, because it's a fairly even though a lot of us are in europe it's still a fairly distributed team this is just uh, a written discord thing everybody says which issue they're going to pick up and then we just have some back and forth about any questions people have. And then we, at the moment, we're trying to pick stuff that can be done within, within the day, um, just to try and get like quick results. Um, but I think we're, at some point we'll hopefully run out of that stuff. And so then I think it'll become more interesting as we start picking up issues that span a few weeks or that take multiple people. Definitely. So what you're saying is we could move that discussion to a public channel where where mm -hmm. 
the general public and more or less orchestrators that are that are daily into this can can at least read and, and give feedback live because uh, are you saying right now it's it's a uh, it's a hidden channel uh, just for core devs on discord is that what you're saying mm -hmm. yeah that's right yep. great uh, what is the current name of the channel or is this uh, would you leave it the same name or would you just uh, join in, in a different channel I think I'd probably just move, yeah, move it to one of the orchestrator ones, I guess. It's just in a, a channel for our team under a Bug Fix Fridays thread at the moment, but we can just move it into one of the um, one of the orchestrator channels. Definitely, yeah. I would love to see a new channel called Bug Fix Fridays. And then, uh, and then <laughs> if, if you want to move that into the public channel, um, I don't know if you have uh, abilities to do that or if you want to contact Shan, but um, I think that would be... We could probably remove, I've, I've talked to them about this, we can remove the Live Peer Academy channel um, just because it's basically archived, not much activity in there. It's kind of taken up room. Um, we could replace that with the Bug Fix Friday uh, channel, uh, which, uh, by the way, I love the name because it gives a time frame when people can mm -hmm. see that it'll be active. How long, how long have yeah. you guys been doing that? Uh, I think this was our second week this week. <laughs> cool. Yeah, what we'll do is um, we'll talk to. Sh I don't know, like I said, I don't know if you have the ability to do it, but um, uh, let's let's remove the Live Peer Academy and change it to the Bug Fix Friday um, channel. Sure, yeah, that sounds good. Let's take a look after this. This call. Okay, very cool. Uh, Tom, how much time do you have? Are you uh, are you still available for a bit, or or what's your? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can stick around for a bit. That's fine. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, is there any other questions for Tom so far? Um, Tom, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, like I said, I've been writing down questions this whole time, um, so uh, I'm gonna keep going if you don't mind. Um, <laughs> yeah, keep going, keep the interrogation going. Cool, <laughs> cool. Um, okay, well, I'll d dig some more back into a little bit of technical stuff um, with the uh, advent of Starlink and satellite um, kind of uh, internet. How do you do? You see Live Peer benefiting from something like Starlink? Um, because uh, you know, and especially in 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 remote geographical locations, um, you know, right now I'm doing a white paper for the Titan Node Miner, right? These are ASIC miners that are that people can join the Live Peer Network. Um, you can buy them, and and ideally you want these to be spread out around the globe, right? Like in in mm -hmm. um, in Central Africa, there are no Amazon servers, uh, AWS servers, but yet there is a ton of population there, right? Um, in mm -hmm. South America, right in the middle, um, in Central Asia, there's all these kind of blank spots. Um, do you see Live Peer working into these areas, and how does how do you see that working in with something like Starlink? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, I think again, it's a little more interesting maybe on the delivery side than the ingestion side. Like um, if some like Broadcasters in these regions can, but they can still ingest maybe a little more slowly. Um, and yeah, something like Starlink might help there if they go via that rather than um, like ground-based infrastructure. But I think on the delivery side, it's more interesting. Like the um, problem at the moment with delivery is like a lot of the last last mile stuff. Um, so CDNs generally, like I know you mentioned AWS, but I think most CDNs also don't have great presence in central africa um it's a little hit and miss in southeast asia like especially as you get into around like indonesia countries with interesting geographies with lots of little islands um south america as well uh, and even just because of like isp nonsense in india and countries around there there's a lot of weirdness around like Going from one side of uh, a city to another, for example, if you're changing ISPs, they sometimes won't talk to each other nicely. You'll end up going out of the country and back in. Um, and so, yeah, for, for that delivery side of things, I think if we can skip a lot of, like, via Starlink or via what, whatever, if the ability to skip a lot of that historical um, complexity that's built up over time and get directly to people, I think will help a lot. And I think 
it's also interesting, um, like the decentralized nature of what we're doing, right? Like in these these areas that maybe still aren't big enough or commercially interesting enough for the big providers to come in and put a node, but maybe are interesting enough, like for a, a single entity or like a small distributed group of people to begin spinning up nodes. I think that's going to be super interesting as we, yeah, if we can start moving towards more of a, like a decentralized in the sense of um, nodes running all over the place in these regions, but also decentralized in the sense of like people focusing on one specific area that they have a really good knowledge of. Um, because a lot of, like a lot of the time, these big companies don't want to take on that like local regional type complexity. It's a lot of overhead, a lot of maintenance, like dealing with the politics of some of these areas is a lot for them to take on. But if you can have people on the ground that are based there and understand these areas a lot better and have connections with local infrastructure providers, I think that's going to be a really interesting uh, vector for decentralization. Yeah, I think I think that's what LivePeer provides in some way, which is I, I, I always thought LivePeer is not as much to, the, the, the problem it solves is le- not so much decentralization because that's a big word that like Bitcoin uses. But I, I think I think for the most part, I think I think Varys brought it up where he, he thinks that the uh, I won't put words into his mouth, but he, he, he talks about how a live peer is permissionless, right? You don't need mm-hmm. you don't need no, no one can deny you or or um, or um, can control what you what you can and cannot say in, in the live peer network. Um, and then I think the second word, which I always thought was interesting, was distributed, right? Um, the, the, the fact that live peer can be distributed in, in far fling corners of the planet uh, with these like micro nodes, right? You can almost have, you know, one, one GPU in, in, in a little area in the middle of the Congo, you know, it, it can provide mm-hmm. that, that data, le- data center level processing power without having to be near a large institutional grade data center that may or may not have political issues. So mm-hmm. I think, I think that's really cool. Um, and so I, I, yeah, I think, I think live peer has a lot of things going for it in that sense. Um, yeah. I think um, also like if you can get a real, like a, almost like a tight network within that region, right? So you have ingest happening within the Congo and then, Distribution also happening, and at no point it has to leave. It's staying in this little um, distributed network within a certain region. I think that's really interesting. I think especially for video, like a lot of the properties of it mean that quite often the video doesn't need to leave that region anyway. There's not going to be a huge market in North America for like this local Congolese content. Um, so yeah, like having a little local network where everything happens within the region i think is is super interesting yeah i think i think a lot of people from first world countries take take for granted the infrastructure we do have um Mm -hmm. and they don't realize that the other three and a half billion people on this planet um lack infrastructure that that we take for granted um and that um you know live peer has the ability to just at least bring those countries and people out of out of issues they have infrastructurally and 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 improve upon them so it's interesting um uh, based on that infrastructure uh, oh Pablo, do you want to ask something uh, well it, yeah it, um regarding the infrastructure thing also um so is there um are there plans from live peer to uh, and something you brought up earlier also with the cdn stuff to mm-hmm. integrate more cdn stuff directly into live peer um, so that you're not reliant on like traditional CDNs? Yeah. So th- there's a, a few different things we're playing around with and I can't actually remember which bits I'm okay to talk about. But yeah, there's um there's a few different initiatives going on and I think at least the idea is that there'll be a much easier path than there is at the moment. To, uh, even if we're not providing the service directly, there'll be an easier path to get set up with a um, video stream coming in via live peer and then a decentralized CDN network as well. That was actually what the, my follow-up to my, to that question was, was will, will it be easier for um, people to use the everything, have like a more of a one um, stop solution where they don't have to then figure out a CDN solution. So um, 
Thank you for, yeah. for jumping ahead yeah. and answering that before I asked it. Yeah. <laughs> And that's like that's kind of a focus as well of this. I think this quarter and next quarter is going to be, yeah, just integration, like integrating more tightly and providing an easier dev experience for Web three builders. And then I think that extends to the CDN side as well, providing a good story around, yeah, how you can set up, get set up end to end with this nice, easy to develop on top of decentralized solution. Yeah, I think that's a big hole right now that, and I think a lot of people don't understand until they come in and really start poking around and they they assume live peer is and they are through the dot com but that the, the uh, protocol doesn't support um full delivery like end to end um mm -hmm. yeah so yeah i think that's going to be really big when that when that comes in Sorry, uh, Titan, I didn't mean to cut you off but no that that was basically my question was around the cdn stuff um you know like yeah like uh, Tom, in your opinion, how 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 difficult is the CDN problem versus the transcoding problem? Like, do do is do you have an opinion on which one's more difficult and uh, and or which one's um, going to be more beneficial to Web three? Um, my gut reaction is that the CDN side is more difficult to do in a distributed way, um, just because you need more nodes um there's more networking involved which is always difficult like transcoding we've i mean like we've, we're already doing a decent job of like having a bunch of high quality nodes it's quite easy to keep track of what we're they're doing and do this verification whereas that become i think that becomes a lot more complex at the edge as you're trying to monitor either within the player or somewhere else like trying to understand what exactly what's happening in a cdn node how it's performing that that stuff is really difficult in traditional cdns um and yeah so i think trying to do that in a distributed world is i think complex it's easy or not easy it's relatively easy if in say north america europe um i think it becomes a lot more complex the more fact like the more network factors and the more like potential unreliability you bring in into the equation. Definitely. Cool. Well, we've been at this for uh, almost an hour. Is there any more questions for Tom? Yeah, I, I got one. Um, um, I see the, uh, the other Alex left. So, but I, I do see that you guys are both commented on this, um, on the zero segment, um, errors that are going around. Um, can you explain a little bit of, uh, what, what's what you know about them or what they are um because i know there was a fix originally rolled out and then it, it got pulled from the latest release and uh, i just mm -hmm. I, I all of a sudden i saw a bunch of them just come rolling in on one of my nodes right now so it, it popped back into my uh head and i um was just curious to know what what what's what 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 are they on are, are those streams that are being um supposed to be uh encoded in a certain way and they're not getting encoded um, I remember reading somewhere back that there's some type of use case where you actually would send a single frame for a video, and I, I in my mind, could not put my head around how how that's video with one one frame. Yeah, it's a bad time for Alex to leave because he's he's one of the ones that's been yeah, keeping the weeds on this. I, was... <laughs> um, I think my understanding is, I think in general, it's not a use case we it's like it, it is something going wrong somewhere in the pipeline before that video gets to us. We, in general, it's not a legit use case for us to be regularly getting single segment frames. Um, but with that being said, it's still something we should be able to handle. Um, okay, so it's more of a, um, sorry, I didn't mean to catch up, but just so that yeah. I understand, it's more of a, uh, it seems like it's more of like some sort of a configuration error, maybe on the broadcaster side. I think, yeah, I think that's our current thinking. And then yeah, it's something, something we're still up. looking into. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. As a follow up to that, because I, I do notice that there, you know, for my year or so that I've been um, running an orchestrator, that there seems to be a lot of errors that come from misconfigured broadcasters. Is there anything that down the road that can be done to maybe lock down the set of uh, configurations that can be um, set by a, a broadcaster or um, so that mm -hmm. there aren't as many streams coming through that just uh, aren't um, transcodable. 
Yeah, that's a good question. And it's something, again, in previous jobs, uh, we've also struggled with, like, you, there's just a wide array of, um, like, uh, streaming side video encoders and different hardware and, uh, like, a million different ways to configure configure that side of things right or potentially mess it up um but i think now we've got i think now we've got the mist team on board and we've got mist more tightly integrated i think there's a bunch of like there's a lot of good opportunity there to at the mist level either correct this stuff as it's coming in or um raise errors in a like in a meaningful way for the people streaming into it um to try and get them to fix whatever they're doing but yeah, I think in yeah, it's always going to be an issue. But I think we can probably do a better job of catch preemptively catching some of that stuff. Yeah, and I, obviously things are going to slip through. But like this zero segment thing has been like like I mean, for the last couple like all, all weekend, it's just been crazy. I mean, I can't get over how many are coming in and they're coming into all nodes. So I'm, like you know, in all regions. So mm-hmm. I'm just like trying to figure out like, well, how do you stop that from happening? Like I would just think that the broadcaster would want to be aware also that. Um, I'm assuming that means the streams aren't making it out to their um, end users. So um, mm-hmm. I don't know if any kind of notification is sent out, you know, out um, back to them or yeah. are they aware. Or, um, but it, it's I, I'm, I'm I mean it, some it is shocking just sometimes when I see like you know several hours of those coming through, just like that's it. Um, mm-hmm. So I mean obviously it's just I mean not obviously, but I'm guessing it's someone just kind of retrying it and retrying and retrying, but. Um, Seems like at some point that they should get some kind of error or something on their side. Said, "Hey, maybe this is, something's not right. You know, just, just yeah. uh, check your configuration, at the very least." Um, right. But, yeah, and like a lot of broadcast software will just do that by default, right? Just retry the same thing again and again. But yeah, that 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 does tie into another strand we've got going on at the moment. Is I want to improve um, like our observability and understanding of what's going on in the network, like to be able to. For example, not rely on the orchestrators to tell us they've been seeing these segments all weekend to like, try and get a bit of a better picture of what's going on and where we're seeing where we're seeing issues and errors, um, and also like to be able to reproduce them more reliably ourselves without relying on getting information from orchestrators. Uh, so yeah, I think that will give us like as we get better at that. I think hopefully some of this stuff should go away. Um, we can just tackle it on our side. And and following up on that, um, it, obviously it would be great for you guys to be able to pick this stuff up. But in the meantime, is there what's the best thing to do? Like when things like that come up, where to report them on GitHub, um, or like you know, because uh, I think most or a good chunk of orchestrators are happy to share that kind of info when they see it happening. Um, mm-hmm. Like is- yeah, I think GitHub. Yeah, definitely for my team, GitHub is best. Like I I do try and follow the Discord. Um, but yeah, just so we have a record of it in a place, like a single place to discuss it. Yeah, I think especially now we're looking at these issues regularly and responding to them. If you could just raise an issue with uh, whatever you have, that would be really good. And is it best just to like, uh, this is just kind of a just thinking out loud here or uh, on the fly, I guess. Uh, is it best to just continue to cr- keep creating new issues for everything that pops up or would it be better if there was like some... Um, I guess it would be hard for people to find, but uh, a topic where it's like, if there's something that's uh, like related where we could just pop it all into the one area. But um, I guess as I'm saying it, it probably makes more sense just to create separate yeah. issues. Yeah, yeah, I can just keep raising them and we'll, at least at the scale we're at at the moment, we can deal with triage and combining issues and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, just keep raising new ones. That's fine for now. Well, I'm excited for the uh, the uh, bug bug fix Fridays channel. I think um, <laughs> I think that will be very cool because we get to see a little more about what the developers are are doing and and even chime in on things that we can we can see ourselves. Right? Mm-hmm. It's very very cool. Any more any more uh, questions there, Papa Bear? No, I think I'm good. I, I really appreciate Tom. I really appreciate you coming. So I'm not ending this here, but uh, I just wanted to let you know uh, I appreciate you coming in. It was very insightful. Yeah, but for me as well, it's always interesting. Like especially um, coming to the Life Peer Community Summit was super interesting. Just like seeing how far removed your guys' experiences from my understanding or like comprehension of it. 
so yeah coming to these is really good i'm going to try and come more regularly i think it's really good for me to have a better picture of what's going on uh, this this time zone does this work for you tom or is it like if you were to come regularly is this a time that you can make it or is it still too late you think no this is great yeah it's uh, 4 p.m to 6 p.m for me so that's fine Oh, is it? Okay. It's four till... Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not in Central European time. Is that right? You're... Yeah, I mean, God's own time zone. Greenwich uh, meantime. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because um, one of the reasons I didn't do these... Um, this... I, I was in New Zealand there for about six months. And uh, it right now, it's, I think, about 4 a.m. there. So... It just wouldn't work for me uh, for hosting these. So that uh, now that I'm back in Canada, um, I think hosting these at this time will be just fine, um, nice. which is good. So I think I think Papa Bear, based on your experience, would you think that this is a good time to continue doing these meetings? I mean, it works for me personally. Um, I can't speak for everyone else. I know there's a lower turnout today than normal, but it's probably also that people aren't, um, you know, not everyone's up on when things change and stuff like that. But um works for me yeah i i think uh I, well because you and i i think are on the most further further most time zone in one direction and then tom is kind of on the further most on the other end and then um we don't get much activity from uh from the asia time zone anyway um and most of the developers are in in the time zone that we're doing right now so i think i think going forward this will be a good time zone to to keep it works okay. for me um, we have um we do have a new guy that's joined on the west coast of the us as well so potentially in the future if you want to move it around we can just change up who comes yeah I, i'm on the west coast as well so um for me it's 8 a.m starting mm -hmm. which is fine because you can get up for 8 a.m right that's no big deal um <laughs> i do like sleeping in of course <laughs> got a new kitten here that thing's up at five o'clock every morning so no problem <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got a new cat oh my goodness that's amazing what's its name uh right now we're calling it oj because it's orange uh but yeah i don't know if that's a permanent yeah there you go say hi to oj for me um great okay well um i mean we've been yeah like it's amazing to have you tom i really really do appreciate you coming on and doing some questions um my hope is that yeah for the next for the next couple of meetings or at least continuing on is to have kind of your team coming on where we can, you know, just do some questions. I know we, we got into the deep of the weeds of uh, some technicals. Um, and it's, you know, ideally we also want to know, learn about who you are and, and, you know, these kinds of things. So I think today was well-rounded. We got to do a lot of different questions and, and topics. So, um, I hope it was enjoyable for you. Um, like I said, hopefully next week and the following weeks we'll have more and more people. I, I really do want to focus on core devs, people in the community that can come in and just do these regularly where we can spotlight people, uh, make them feel welcome and uh, and have that discussion. So um, it's great to have you, Tom. Uh, you're, feel free. I mean, please stick around to the end. Uh, we'll, we'll do this about for about a 30 more minutes uh, and we'll continue on with the rest of the topics. I know some people left, but there's like one key topic I really want to talk about um, coming up next year. So, but otherwise, I just want to thank you, Tom, for, uh, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been, it's been great. Cool. All right. Um, Alex Searing Snowed, you talked about key management. Let's jump into it. Um, what is your question? And like, what do you see? What, what, do you, what do you see? Yeah, so I think um, like the, the most ideal sort of uh, objective at this rate is to help prove some of the bigger hoops uh, orchestrators have to jump through or I guess uh, patterns with either collecting tickets or, or self-staking deliberately on uh, like dummy accounts to prevent, to, to improve risk profiles. Um, curbing some of that behavior or just having uh, this, the orchestrator stacks tooled in a way where there's just less um, extraneous work that has to be done to secure things. That's sort of the beginning intent with this. Uh, Cause I think Marco raised something last week that was, uh, I guess I didn't know about, which was where certain orchestrators will actually share 
transcoders um, in order to, I guess, obfuscate certain behaviors. Um, but yeah, the idea is, you know, to prevent sort of what happened to night note a while back um, happening again, and then just providing better or even just slightly better um, out of the box security um, for orchestrators. And I think this would initially probably lean more on Linux side, but in time would probably be definitely propagated to Windows. But um, but yeah, and this and the key management. I mean, that could mean uh, anything from how do I keep you know the the keys for the ETH account that my node is linked to on my node more secure, or uh, can I indicate a secondary payout wallet um, so that I don't have a lot of hot fees. Um, in that, uh, I guess what I ju just to kind of narrow the conversation, uh, let's assume that this doesn't include uh, the notion of key management for restart behavior. Um, so predominantly just, you know, how do I make sure that the uh, ETH account that my or the ETH address that my node is linked to is generally speaking secure uh, and something that I you know, have a, a good way to observe. Does that, um, does that make sense? Yes, I love it. Um, security is something I take quite seriously in some areas, and then just definitely not in others. So um, I'm I'm of the opinion of both things, where I suck at some things and I'm great at others. Um, so one thing that I've noticed with um, with Live Peer is, yeah, some of the lack around key um, management around storage um but also key creation um and i haven't quite figured out what optimal what this optimally would look like but ideally nodes it's tough because they have to submit a transaction to call reward and to redeem tickets um because i know we talked about one time how we would want to you know have hard wallets hooked up um to your keys but the right. pro problem with that is now you have to sign a transaction on that hard wallet, which means you have daily reward calls and ticket redemptions, um, which wouldn't be very conducive to an automated, um, especially if you're winning tickets every 10 minutes, right? You can't just sit there by your treasure uh, constantly accepting transactions. Um, Definitely. But I, I did think if of... If I was winning one every 10 minutes, I'd sit by mine. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 your papa bear you sit there anyway so it doesn't it doesn't you're excluded um hey, you don't have to tell me about that. um but um one thing i've noticed yeah so i i've i've been bad with key management in some ways because i've i i ran all my vps's with my uh, my key account on them before i realized you can just create a, a random key and have a redeemer uh set up so that was the redeemer, I think, really helped the security a lot. Um, and then I found out that you can give gas fees, you can give ETH to your individual nodes, and they can redeem it on behalf of your node, which would then completely secure your key because you never ever have to have it connected in any way whatsoever to the public internet, publicly facing, right? Yeah, but then I found out if you redeem a ticket like that, it doesn't show up on the leaderboard, and I was like, "Well, that's no good because, because uh, you know, I want people to see that I'm redeeming tickets and that I'm doing work, right?" Yeah, got to catch up to varies somehow, right? <laughs> um, that's being that is being looked into though. So hopefully for the next explorer that works properly. Right. Um, what did you have in mind? Oh, and Alex, you, you quickly, I don't know where I'm going with this, but Alex, where, where, what did you say about the, the, the people obfuscating tea, sharing of teas? What did you mean by that? Oh, yeah. So this was, um, I, I guess so someone internally was getting clarification. And um, basically, it, it, was, it was similar um, to what Adam's working on, um, which, which is why when you use a Redeemer node, 
Um, sometimes you you will not see those show up in the Explorer. And it has to do with, um, you know, because an orchestrator, there is there's an ETH account address and an ETH orchestrator address, which uh, are both used for specific things. So basically, when you have a Redeemer node, uh, you're, to my understanding, pointing ETH account address somewhere else. Um, and then when you initialize your orchestrator, those, I, I think both of the, both of the addresses that are used are ETH orchestrator address. So basically, you know, it, it's intuitive in that when you use a redeemer, um, the ticket isn't being claimed by the orchestrator address. Uh, and as a result, um, you know, it doesn't show up in, in the Explorer. Um, but, you know, Adam's working on that. So basically, uh, th there was a behavior, and Marco described this. He said, uh, just to add some context, some orchestrators use uh, this, uh, this ETH account address to share transcoding machines with each other, they use a fresh ETH account address and let that redeem their actual uh, ETH orchestrator address so that other people on the machine can't steal the key store file and password. So basically, he's describing using Redeemer. Um, and then I, I guess like, like on Discord, there's been some other wild stuff as well, um, which is very, I, I don't think it's like pervasive. This is, you know, one to maybe three people doing it. Um, and effectively, like it's, it's sort of a bizarre way of like what you should just do running a redeemer. Um, but yeah, so I, I guess, you know, the, the curious thing here is, is separating the key management of like the key store files themselves and then how people would ideally like to interact with a wallet uh, linked to their orchestrator. And of course, like without Go Alive here is written, uh, a lot of that is sort of set in stone. Um, but, you know, the, the important point is, you know, how much of, like, like what critical operations can only be done with a machine that has those, those key store files sitting on it. That's yeah, a... so I know with the, uh, with the ETH org address method that a few of us use, we can't call rewards um, using that method, so we still need... The, the main key store on one machine. So if if there was a way to enable that so that the random address that we have while pointing to our main orchestrator address can also call rewards, that would mean you know we wouldn't need a redeemer and we wouldn't need any key store files on any of our nodes if we're running GeoDNS, which would be awesome. Interesting. And can you just just to, so I make sure like I'm I'm understanding. Can you, can you understand why you go through that process? Um, cause I, I pretty much understand why, but, but just like from start to finish, uh, like high yeah. level. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just a really simple way of keeping things secure. Um, and I don't need to worry about having to set up a redeemer node or, or wondering if it's going to, to work. And also redeemer node can, you know, unless you're running multiple redeemers, um, it's one single point of failure for your entire stack of, uh, of orchestrator nodes. Um, so this, to me, it, it keeps everything centralized on each on each node, um, and I don't have to worry about the redeemer causing a failure on everything. Right, and then and you're forcing uh, the generation of a of a new uh, like ETH account address, right? So I'm actually, I don't know about everybody else, but I'm using the same throwaway ETH account on all my O's. I just um, create a new, you know, I, I nano a new uh, key store file. And I just paste in the, the data from the other servers that already have it on. So I just create that key store on each node um, and it will automatically use that one. Oh, geez, that's brilliant. I wish I thought of that. Interesting. Just, so, Interesting. yeah, that's. Can, can you say that one more time? I, I, I didn't completely follow, part, partly because OJ walked across my uh, laptop at the time. <laughs> but, um, what, uh, so, how exactly are you doing it? Yeah, so it's just one, I guess, quote unquote, burner ETH account um, that I created at one point on, on one of my nodes. And I'm just using that same key store file on all my, um, all my nodes. And then I point to the, the orchestrator address so it knows that it's using an active orchestrator to redeem the winning tickets to. Um, and that, that works. So I don't have like so multiple. Let me ask you, stop you there just cause that's the part I don't understand. So the orc address that you're pointing to that has your, the, the what, what, 
What that's your, my, what your, that's what? my that's like my explorer address. That's my actual orchestrator address. So is there does that machine have the your the other key on it? Your your main key for um no your sorry your live so there's no live peer key. There's anywhere. no live peer key at all on any of the machines except for one because of the issue that we can't call. Okay, so so one one machine still one machine still needs it. Right? Yeah, that's so, okay. That's that's what, what I'd love missed. to see okay. to see tweaked because you know not having our keys on any of our nodes would be ideal without even having to use a redeemer or set anything up in that regard. But, That'd be sweet. Just to clarify though that that node that you are running your you are you're calling reward on you that doesn't even need to be set in redeemer mode that can just be a standalone o correct yeah yeah it yeah. seems so 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 basically what you've done is you've completely circumvented the need for a redeemer node in general right right yeah. and I, I can't take credit for it that was like night nodes original finding but yeah you don't need a redeemer uh, unless you know because you do have that one node that needs the key store on it you know you could point that to a redeemer so you're fully secure but if you're gonna but, call uh, reward at least the standalone o is could be honest like fairly locked down machine that is only sending outbound transactions to an ethereum uh an account like like there's it doesn't need to be public facing in any way, which would be so much more secure than the current setup. Oh yeah, that would be. I didn't even think about that. So yeah. you could almost have like a dummy O, even just set up just to basically like set up as a redeemer in a sense. Yeah, but and it that'll, that'll work. And but it, but if it goes it. down, it won't. It won't take down every other node like a redeemer would. Huh. It, it literally is just calling arbitrarily calling reward. Like it's you 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 grab yourself. Like a Raspberry Pi or a computer that you really, really trust, you firewall it up, you lock it down. Hell, even spin up your own ETH and Arbitrum node. Well, I just pointed to Fort Coonsman, and all it does is call reward. And like, it you could even unplug the inner. Like, ideally though, the ideal situation is where your orchestrator keys never have to be exposed to the public internet right? right like that's what treasure and ledger do right they never you, you your keys are never never exposed to um to the public internet you it it's on a, a, a air-gapped device where if you want to send a transaction it will give you the transaction hash in order to do it but it's never exposed right um, whereas when you create the orchestrator account, when you first launch it, you automatically are exposing it to a machine that could be on the internet. But to call reward, it has to be exposed in some way. But with the current setup, you have authority. It, it's, per, it's like pretty damn safe because like you can lock down that machine very well. Um, Whereas the way I have it set up, I have it set up the same way where I have um, dummy accounts on all my orchestrators that are actually doing the orchestrator work that are connected to all the T's, right? Um, but then I'm running a redeemer node where all the tickets get sent to a node that I have that's connected to each of those nodes that could redeem and call reward but they're still public facing because you can reach into my computer publicly through that open port because it has to listen for the tickets to come in. So there's right. still there's still technically an open even though I only have my key uh, uh on one uh machine it still has a public open facing port which is really sketchy. And then on top of that, uh, my daughter unplugged the uh, the compute, but that that machine, and it shut down my entire global network of orchestrators. So, yep, that is also not ideal from a technical standpoint. <laughs> I mean, that's that's it sounds like the biggest advantage to having an O do that for you instead of having a Redeemer. I mean, which um, I, I don't know if anyone here knows, but why does the Redeemer uh, take down the, take down everything if it goes down? 
because it won't ex- it won't accept tickets because the orchestrator can't read the ticket. Right? Oh, got it. Got it. Yeah, that actually makes sense. So the way the redeemer sets up is it directs the ticket to be read on the redeemer node. So the orchestrator instead of reading it itself, it it's just, just passing it along. It just yeah. passes it along, but if if the node that reads the ticket goes down, well then it doesn't it can't properly charge the broadcaster, so it shuts down. Or it can't properly I, read the ticket. Yeah, no, no, that, 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 that totally makes sense. I, I, um, I don't use a redeemer, so I just, yeah, but now, now that you say that, it totally makes sense. And I, I think that uh, Authority Null's way of doing it with an orchestrator basically as a redeemer is the, seems like the best solution right now with yeah. what we've got. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a bit, it's a bit jank, you know, if, if the uh, transaction showed up correctly on the Explorer and the history, and you could still call rewards using this method, it would be really, really good. But there's still some, some caveats there. The orchestrator it, that has the, um, the, the key on it can't call the rewards? No, it cannot. I, I did test it and you still need one orchestrator that is, uh, connected directly to your or a redeemer you know to your uh, key store redeemer yeah because your own node has to call a reward from its own account you can't submit a transaction from an outside account um because that would be controlling your account the only reason you can do it with winning tickets is because you can claim the winning ticket but then you can just say well it's no different than oh i claim this 0.1 eth and i'll just transfer it to to this guy so you can you can send someone ETH no problem. So it's like I can redeem it on behalf of them because they'll just get the money for it. Yeah, interesting. And then just to be clear, so when you say you're pointing this other orchestrator at your orchestrator ETH account, like like what attribute uh, are you setting to to like point it there? Other than just like pasting in the uh, the key store file. To, to point it to my main orchestrator address is what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, so it's just the, the ETH org address or the adder uh, flag. Cool. Okay, that, that's what I figured. I, 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 was, I just wanted to make sure we were on the, the same page there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah that, that's interesting. I, I'd heard of that, but I, I had not had heard it like explained in full before. Definitely interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of an accident that we found this, uh, this way of it working. Um, I'm not sure if the ETH... Uh, account uh, flag does anything differently that might help this situation at all, or I've never messed with that at all. I haven't either. Um, Which flag is that? Yeah, well, and then yeah, okay. So, so then, like, uh, ideal world, um, what? Yeah, aside from obviously, we can't rewrite everything, right? But what would be, um, you know, in, in lieu of say a redeemer node would would be an even more ideal flow. Um, in in your opinion, based on the setup you have that that has improved kind of the the experience of doing this. Um, honestly, it's it's a really simple way of of doing it. I I can't think of anything that would make it smoother. You know, if you understand Linux enough, you can do this very very quickly. Um, it's just those two caveats that if if they were tweaked a bit or if there was a way to make them work without rebuilding everything from the ground up, that would be so, so efficient. It, in my opinion, nothing needs to be rebuilt. It actually already works the way it's supposed to, like for authority. Like I'll probably switch over to the way authority does it because your key, now you can run an orchestrator, global orchestrator, without having your keys exposed to the public internet in any way with any port um with the way he's doing it and all he's doing is re- is completely removing the redeemer aspect the redeemer node um like literally you can just delete the redeemer node and just say well this is the new way we do it and it would be when like as probably secure as you probably could get without having gapped uh, keys but the gapped keys is not really going to be a great way of doing it anyway because you have to call reward daily. Yeah, I mean, you know, you still need that one machine pointing to a redeemer or with that the main key store on that machine, at least for one node, you know, at the moment. 
Well, no, no, no. What do you mean pointing? You don't need... Your, your, your standalone orchestrators on the VPSs don't need to point to anything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot that whole conversation we just had. Like, the, the whole idea is that standalone O on the VPS has dummy keys on it with, like, a small amount of ETH, and it can redeem tickets on behalf. So, therefore, you'd never have to point anything to anyone, ever. And then your keys are on the most secure machine you can find, and all it does is send an outbound transaction once a day ca calling Roared. And it can do that without you having to open any ports or yes, right. mess with any of that That's stuff? That's right, yeah, because it's an outbound transaction. So you just, you never have to, like, you could lock down that thing so tight, um, and you're just sending one transaction a day. Man, I might have to try that. Yeah. That would be the best way to do it. I think it. what's what's a little confusing is calling them dummy accounts, um, ETH accounts, because they're they're not. I mean, they they are actual ETH accounts. It, I think maybe we need to come up with a better term for it because that's what was throwing me off. Is that uh, dummy account to me means almost like you just you're using like an address that doesn't do anything, but it it technically does call the or you know the the sorry claim the ticket, and it is a working account. It's just not exposing your entire orchestrator and uh, to to the. Uh, to the internet is that correct it's like yeah sure it's, right. it's like canon. So, so it's really it's like it's it's like a, it's really more of like a um we'll Can, like canon a, fodder it's like a ticket redeeming account <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean know? i just call it a throwaway account because if yeah you know if said something did happen it doesn't it doesn't matter you know compared to losing yeah no no and, and i i get it i think that's what threw me when you were original when you talked about it in the past is i was like a dummy account i just thought it was like i, I just i didn't think about how the whole thing worked and i was like Oh, it just sounds like it's something that you just pop it in there just so that it has an, an ETH account yeah. and it will start running. But it, it is a, a, a real, it is an account. I didn't realize that you use the same one on each machine, which makes it a lot easier than having to. Yeah, I mean, you could for us use... to run multiple nodes, like having to have just all these different accounts for each one. That, that's yeah, that's I mean, why if I was you like, wanted to go, like go crazy, yeah. then yeah. No, I don't. I don't it's, not, it's not. I mean, I, I'd be very fine with just having enough, you know, ETH exposed to be able to. Uh, claim tickets it, it honestly if if the explorer just accounted for oh. the tickets that were redeemed by other accounts then we could all use this method and it would be probably as secure as you can make it like it would be it would make me happy on the security front yeah i mean it just doesn't show on the transaction history it does update in the eth earn tab was it? Um, and I, I, yeah, and I did make a, a GitHub issue about it on the Explorer section of the GitHub. So uh, hopefully, that's taken into consideration for the next Explorer iteration. So that means it also doesn't show up in the like the orchestrator payouts channel. Then, no, it does. It does. Oh, it does. It doesn't show up with your name with your uh, org name if you've got like a, you it, know an ETH a no, dot ETH. It does. Right. Oh, it does. Yeah. The only thing that doesn't show up um, that I found is the history, is the transaction history on the Explorer page. Oh, screw. Uh, who's looking at that anyway? Yeah. Right. <laughs> screw that. I take security yeah, that, over that any that's day. That's the only thing. Yeah. So, so on the oh, main. I, I thought it didn't. I thought it didn't total up uh, uh, on your. Uh, oh no, it like does. Show. Yeah. Oh. oh. Then it's, it sounds like it's almost all the way there. Then I mean. Yeah, it, dude, it's it, there. Yeah. I just we just need to educate people on this method. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over to authorities method. That sounds way better. Me, me too. And, and uh, yeah, someone's got to write yeah, that up. Definitely. So, like, uh, someone should write that up because I think that'd be helpful for for a lot of people. Because for sure, I, I knew but, that's what you were doing. I mean, I knew you were doing something like that, but I didn't know exactly how it worked. And um, and I mean, we talk a lot, so <laughs> uh, authority and I. So like for me to not have understood exactly what was going on there i think it would be really helpful if one uh, maybe authority if you could uh just make a little like you know how to um for you know uh i mean i, I could figure it out now now that we've had this chat but i think there's a lot of people that would benefit from uh knowing yeah i can write, write something up for sure uh, and then i guess titan if you want to try that standalone o method and make sure that works that pretty much covers everything yeah, because you, what you want is to have a standalone O on a lockdown machine that just calls reward daily. And then the whole calling of the reward daily is arbitrary in itself, but, you know, I guess it's for calculation, so you need to. But, um, yeah, that, that would be pretty dang secure. 
Um, beyond that, I, yeah, you've got hard wallets. So one one concerning thing about this method to me, um, and you'd have to be pretty creative as a someone who's trying to exploit this. Um, but you know, there's nothing really stopping someone from if they can access your machine to go into your uh, live peer config and just change the eth org address flag to point to their own orchestrator um and then all the winning tickets would be redeemed to whoever that is um nothing's really stopping anyone from doing that if they do get access to your machine now they they'd have to be an active orchestrator but still that would be the the least thing i'd be worried about if i had a major security breach yeah, yeah, like it's it's a really small thing, but it is you know it is possible for someone just to change that text. Sure, but like, a, yeah, yeah, but like, man, uh, would be the least of my worries because because the other the uh, the current architecture as well, you lose your keys. So, oh yeah, I mean, it's way better than that. Yeah, I, I, that that seems like a minimal problem because I, I I really don't think other orchestrators. Like, not to mention, it just exposes the orchestrator that did it. Like, it's kind of, I don't know if the motivation would be there. That would be very, um, very likely. Um, so ever since I started making YouTube videos and doing stuff, I get, I get pretty spearfish now. Like, lately, the last, like, two weeks have been really bad. Like, definitely spearfishing is coming my way because they find out information about me and they try to make friends with me. It's, it's really bizarre. Um, wow. Yeah. Hey, you gotta be careful. Yeah. I'm getting, and like, I'm getting custom made links for me, articles made about me with like tracking on it. Like it's like, dude, it's like, yeah, I'm getting super spearfished right now. Um, and the only reason I know about this is because I've, um, one of my good friends just recently got spearfished and like lost, the amount of money that most people retire on so it's it's very concerning um so my defenses are are rising quickly um and so yeah like these vps servers are super vulnerable um you as a person are vulnerable um vulnerabilities lie everywhere with uh, self custodial assets um so i guess i guess like to be honest authority null's way of doing this is the solution the only other backup you could prob probably think of when it comes to key management is some sort of migration tool um where you would have a multi-sig account that would allow the migration of the current orchestrator to a new account and those keys could be on a treasure or offline and so therefore if anyone tried to steal your account you could enable a like self-destruct uh, move method that because you have the rest of the keys that were never public, no one could actually take, you, you could recover your current account. Um, right. So it's so sort of like a, like a second factor in the form of a, another ETH account that can sign yeah. against yeah uh, you can sign original. you can yeah. sign an emergency uh parachute which you could because like night node had to tell all his delegators to move stake and like he, he lost you know that that's that's a big move right trying to to get people yeah. to move stake so you could almost do a parachute where hey you can you can sign a multi-sig emergency move and it brings all your delegators with you. That would be the only technical front where I could see you could improve security. Because that's not actually implemented yet. But the current setup with authority is actually as safe as you're probably going to get. I agree. So, so yeah, so, so from this, um, I, I guess the takeaway is, you know, I, I want to make sure that I, that I understand this uh, as, cl as clearly as possible and then maybe start formalizing or or just uh maybe you know yeah just just formalizing this process maybe with the idea that that it is clearly um superior to running a redeemer uh security wise uh so i, I can start that process and then uh 
the the notion of having sort of a second factor or like a, a parish capability that that would probably be pretty far off but i think you know there, there's a clear you know orchestrator experience you, you know just example of where that could be very useful so i think and i haven't really thought about that too much prior but i, I think you raise a really good point and uh yeah so i, I can start uh working on that on my end but yeah that i think we've worked through a lot of really productive stuff here because initially i i was not aware of that flow but it, it makes complete sense um yeah i i would almost for simplicity like there's, there's a saying that if it's not necessary then it's necessary not to right and it's right. like if it's not necessary to have a redeemer node then it's necessary not to have a redeemer node and like I think the redeemer node function actually should just be removed and replaced with the dummy node the method. We we can call it something else other than a dummy node, but I think that should be the default method for security. Cool. Yeah, I can I can look into that. I know basically there's just um as a just yeah, there's a heads up. Uh the Impetus for the next quarter uh, is predominantly streamflow oriented, um, so like reducing latency, and then uh, the fast verification, to my knowledge, is first and foremost. Um, so, in terms of you know the documentation being updated and, and and sort of the advised setup, like that is secondary um and it can kind of go in parallel likely because that's mostly just a, a documentation and, and messaging um pivot but um but yeah no i think that's definitely a move in the right direction um because it, it like, like you said like, like there there's security gains from this assuming you understand kind of the, the complex basis of it which once you understand is pretty simple but like, it would make sense to me that Someone initially looking at this would be like, oh, well, that's, you know, sort of, it's less intuitive than you'd think. But, um, but yeah, no, I think um, I definitely got kind of what I was looking for. And uh, I think there's some room for improvement here. Uh, I, honestly, I don't think there's really anything that needs to be done, especially if you guys are focusing on Streamflow. Like, like, cool. Like. The fact of the matter is authority and Nightnode has figured out the most secure way of doing this without any of the consequences um basically of the of the node itself when it comes to branding and fees and all this stuff. So right. I, I think the solution is actually just education. Like like whether you rede remove the redeemer node or not, like as it's arbitrary. Like you, you can, you can't, like whatever. It's already there. Like it doesn't it's probably the lowest priority ever. There's only like I think me and like one other people will use it. Like I think I think honestly the best thing would be education, which is just like maybe authority do up a nice article that says the most secure way of running your orchestrator node tutorial and like that becomes the standard. And then from there the problem is actually fixed. So cool. Yeah, no, I think um yeah, and, and the, the big thing was like internally there was a question because like me and Marco had talked about this a bit. Uh, there was a question of like, is this like how pervasive it is, or or like has this been hardened? And, and now like you know my confidence is much higher that this is uh, obviously like a, like a vetted approach that uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But um. But yeah. Cool. That I actually learned a lot today. Thank you, Authority, for your information on that. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm sorry that I didn't try and clarify earlier. I thought I thought everybody kind of knew what I was getting at when I tried to explain it, but I, I guess I did a pretty poor job originally. I, no, I, no, no, no worries, no worries. I, I knew of how are you doing it. I just thought the drawback was that it didn't show up, and I thought, well, node branding is important for me. But if I can get the ETH fees I was to show same, up, same same boat as uh, Titan there. I, I knew what you were doing, but I I, I thought it I, I thought there were more things that weren't. Uh, showing up the way that they uh, should, so I was like, eh, I don't know if it's worth it. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, so I, 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 don't, I'm I'm glad it came up today, and I'm glad you explained uh, it, it, like some of the more of the details of it because um, yeah, it, I'm going to change over to that system. So um, mm. it, 
And if we do that properly as orchestrators, this will become even more hard, hard, a very much hardened network because we will have much safer key management. And then Alex, when it comes to the parachute idea, unfortunately, in order to um, likely um, do the parachute idea, you'll have to create the multi-sig on creation of the wallet, which means everyone yeah. who has a current wallet will not be able to retroactively create a multi-sig, which would mean all of us pretty much don't get access to this parachute option anyway. Um, so. Oh yeah, no, no, it would be uh, like if it was prioritized and, and if it, it became something that seemed that, like say like three other people are compromised when if life here, you know, gain more popularity. Uh, May, like I think if it became clear like that was potentially an issue, then, then maybe that that's when you'd start to see some of this. But yeah, I mean, it, it would basically require like a, some form of migration again. And I think that kind of hurdle again is probably not something we want to do even in like a year. Uh, <laughs> but but the feature makes makes a lot of sense, obviously. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I think I think your expectations there are are well um calibrated yeah i think this is a solved problem and literally just needs to be formally published awesome yeah so, so just to clarify there the, the standalone o would still need to be on like a vps with some connection to the internet right it would when, just be locked down when you say standalone o you mean the, the o the one calling the word call. yeah yeah no no it's not on a vps it's on your it's on a secure device. That's the key part. It's okay. like something you have physical access to. Yeah. Gotcha. It's it's not it's not on a rented server. This is this is where you store your keys. So this is going to be okay. on a device that's in your presence, that is on a device that only has one function, which is to call reward and hold those keys. Gotcha. All yeah. right. So this. Yeah. This, the whole point is you do not want it on a VPS. That's that's what we're trying to avoid is having right, that right, right. there. And you want nothing else running on it. Um, you want it to be super locked down and, you know, internet speed, all these things have no, have no, um, no, no, bearing. no bearing. Yeah. yeah, of no importance. In fact, and then that next level security was making sure, you know, you could run your own if you want to get real crazy, you could run your own Ethan Arbitrum node, which point, which then broadcasts the block directly from your node, which means your keys never even use an external node. But that's that's getting pretty intense. I mean, if you're yeah, using that's, Fort, that's we we can pretty much trust Fort Koonsman, but you know, in Fira Alchemy, that because they can always intercept your information when you yeah. do broadcast stuff, but. For the most part, we trust external nodes. I we'll have to build a little Linux box or something. Get a Raspberry Pi. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I don't know if you can run la uh, Raspberry Pi. You probably just need like a a ninety dollar motherboard with like an Intel three chip on it, and just you know, hundred bucks. And you could just get. I'm pretty sure yeah, you you can get like an Intel NUC because those are x86. NUC. Yeah, they're, they're like those, see, yeah. like the next unit of computing. They're they're these like small like four by four inch, low power um, x eighty six boxes that that Intel's had for a while. Oh, Intel knock. Okay, there you go. Okay, we've been at this for two hours twelve minutes. Uh, we're gonna wrap it up here. Um, any All last good. any last comments before we sign off? Uh, I think this was the best water cooler we've had since they started, and I think a lot of them have been really good, but I think this one takes the cake, so that's my two cents. This one's been very oh. technical, very educational, so appreciate you all being Going here. Going in the right direction. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, it's chats like these that uh, continue to improve the community, improve communication, and uh, Tom, I'm looking forward to seeing that Bug Fix Friday channel. Um, I think... Uh, I think a lot of the orchestrators that are active in here would love to see that um, and even chime in every once in a while. So very, very cool. Uh, yeah, sounds good. I'm looking forward to looking forward to getting people involved. Very cool. 
All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this water cooler chat. And uh, we will see you all next week. Cheers. Awesome. Thanks, all. Thanks. Bye, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye.